something similar to what we, uh, what we always do, um, and then touch on some of the data associated with the new varieties that are coming out, and then sort of finish with a little bit of more forward-looking sort of work that we're, that we're doing. And so really, the whole purpose of what we're aiming to do is to develop uh, new cotton varieties, essentially that have got more yield, got fibre quality that our customers, um, our singing customers are looking for, uh, resistance to all the diseases that we have, um, probably mostly associated with, um, with irrigated production, um, adaptation to all regions and all production systems, and with GM traits that are of relevance to our industry. And the way we do this is really through integrating traditional breeding um, and, and a whole range of modern tools together with an understanding of what the market is looking for. And so that's sort of, and so over the years, um, we've made pretty good, I guess, um, pretty good progress across a lot of those things. And, and, uh, and most of the industry has been pretty well serviced with, with varieties. And that's probably in most situations isn't, isn't a living factor. So I guess for dry land production systems specifically, the, um, it, they, it has, you know, it has different challenges in comparison to, uh, to comparison to those under irrigation. And, uh, for example, disease is, 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 is obviously much more of an issue under, under irrigated situations, particularly the soil of diseases. And with dry land, lack of rainfall is always the, always the major challenge. Some of this might be a little bit small, um, but this, I just wanted to go through, I guess, um, reasonably briefly around the, the suite of lines that are being tested um, currently um, for release over the next, um, uh, the next year or so. And so all of this set, so there's a, uh, uh, there's a set of, as you can see there, there's a set of five lines that are being tested. Um, some or all of these will be released. You'll notice that they're not, they're not named at the moment until that decision is made. And then I'll just go through a few characteristics. Um, the data on the bottom here uh, is, a, is an amalgamation of all of the data that we've got um, from all of the, the sites um, for ever since these have been started to test. Now, one of the caveats that I will make, which may or may not mean much to you anyway, but there is different differing levels of data that go into each of these. Um, each of these. So the ones, uh, this line at the top has got five years of data, and this one here's only got two years of data. Now everything is relative to the controls, but it just means that the accuracy of the data here is going to be a lot more than the accuracy of the ones that you get further down, as we've got less and less seasons associated with that data. And so, so that's the, the caveat on, on this. So just to quickly run through um, what we've got, and, and probably starting with one of the ones that I think is, is most interesting, and particularly for, um, for dry land, is, is the line that's labeled CSX 1049 B3XF. Um, so this is some new germplasm that's coming through. Um, it's normal leaf. In terms of the, uh, for those that have sort of been in the industry a fair while, um, we've been talking for the last 10 years or so a fair bit around seed density, which is just really a, a, essentially a measure of um, uh, the inherent sort of characteristics of the seed in terms of being able to get it established. Um, and so we have things that are called low density and things that are called normal density. Um, normal in, 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 in the context that we're talking about um, is going to be a whole lot easier established than something that has a low density seed. A low density seed typically is lighter um, and has less, less sort of um, constituents in the seed. Mostly because it's petitioning more of that energy that it, um, that it develops into producing lint rather than producing things like oil in the seed. So there's always a trade-off between these things. It'd be great to have everything. Um, so this is a uh, this is a, a normal density line. Um, it can often be relatively compact um, in terms of its growth, though it does vary depending on the conditions. Um, this is a line that has performed consistently the best under dry land systems. And so we've had this out at, um, out at Angus's for the last uh, five seasons. And so we've got a fair bit of data um, on this. And Bob, you've, you've got 
there is up in that corner now. You've got large scale data as well that you'll that you'll show that. Okay. Uh, and there's a few things there around um, some of the other regions where, where it might fit. And then we sort of move through, I guess, the more mainstream sort of varieties or, or lines that are coming through. Um, and I won't, I won't sort of spend too much time on them. I'll, I'll touch on the data in a sec. The last one is, a, um, is an opera leaf line, which is the CSX 4389. Um, it is opera leaf and it has performed um, pretty well under dry land. Um, but, um, but in our data, it, it hasn't. Um, the, the pick of the ones, the pick of them in dry land systems is at is at 1049. And so, if we just, if you just want to have a look at this uh, at this table here, I guess you'll see the 1049 hasn't isn't um, isn't typically quite as good under irrigation, um, but it has performed particularly consistently under under dry land and across a range of different seasons. I mean, there's been seasons where it's been two and a half bales up to about seven um, and, um, and it has been very consistent across, um, across that range of seasons. Mostly it's pretty good. Um, staple length I would, I would prefer um, to be, have a little bit longer staple um, but generally speaking it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Um, that, that staple here is, is, is fairly equivalent, and I haven't got it on, on here, is fairly equivalent, um, maybe a hundredth shorter than Cyclot 748 B3F, but it's pretty good. Um, and generally a pretty good, um, pretty good other fibre package. And so again, there's a few other things in here. Uh, the 5439 um, is, is the, the, does have a much longer staple. Um, and look, it has performed, um, you know, pretty good under dry land as well. But uh, but we do need some more data just to see how consistent that's going to be. But um, interesting. Now, this is this these these numbers here are all relative to Cyclot seven four six, um, which you might say that that's mostly not what we grow under dry land um, seven four eight. Um, on this scale here, it's because it's because of all the irrigated data. I had to have a, a variety that was that was compared across all sites and all production systems. Um, on this scale, Cyclot so seven four eight B three F sits at about one oh two to put it into context. Um, so look, the, the data for that, particularly that ten forty nine, does look quite good. And in fact, all of those varieties. Um, um, I think actually have a uh, have reasonable performance under under dry land. So, I think we got any questions about that before I move on to sort of a bit more future looking stuff. So you need glasses, Angus. You, you, you said that you said that was a year or so behind. So yeah, consequently, a seed production of that one further behind. Uh, you mean this one here? No, no, no the 1049. This is the most advanced. So oh, this, okay, so yeah, yeah, this is, this has got five years of data in it. Yeah, okay. This has only got two. Okay. So they're all at sort of different stages, but 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 this one is the um, it's it's um, th there's no issue. And in fact. All going well, the seed crops are on the ground, but all going well, there, there will not be any issues with availability of seed of any of those varieties. Okay. With there'll be other restrictions on area rather than seed. Is that for next year, Warwick? Is it? Yeah. So Bob, I think, will talk about the um, <coughs> about the, the the sort of release of extended flex and stuff like this. But from a seed production point of view, assuming that the seed that gets harvested this year is all good. Um, it, of these ones that we decide to release, which may be all of them, it may be some of them, we haven't made that, we won't make that decision until middle of the year. Um, there will be seed available this coming season of all of them yet. Right. Um, in addition to that, and I, ha I haven't presented any data on this, there is one extend flex alone line. Now that's um, the, the primary purpose for development of this is, is for refuge, and it's called CSX 8674. So no Bolgard 3, but to use as a, um, as a refuge option primarily. Um, the purpose, I mean, we would, uh, we're also aiming to, whilst its performance is, is, is okay, 
Um, it's, as I said, at the moment we're primarily saying that it's a, um, something to use as a refuge. Obviously you don't want, if you're going to grow extended flax cotton, you don't want to put RRF in the, in the same field. You'll end up like what Bob did to you, wouldn't you? <laughs> so, so I'll just finish off, I guess, looking a little bit more, uh, a little bit more towards the future. Um, and there's a lot of words up there, but I'll just, I'll just work through it. So we are, we have started a, um, I guess, for one of a, a better term, a new dryland breeding sort of uh, breeding and selection program. Um, early days yet. We're only, we're only just kicking this off. And so really all of the varieties that we've had to date over however many years really have been just based on, uh, the selection has really been based on field selection for yield and fibre quality and all those things that you can measure. And that's been highly successful, I mean, to develop the varieties that we've got. For dry land though, um, the, the wide variations in environment make it quite difficult to consistently achieve um, genetic gains for developing varieties specifically for dry land. One year it rains, the next year it doesn't. Sometimes it rains in January, sometimes it rains in March. All of that makes it quite challenging to, to consistently make genetic gains. Um, whereas under irrigation, things are much more controlled and, um, and, and, and much more predictable. And so part of the way that we're looking to try and address that is to, um, we've got a, I guess a new research area that, that focuses on four key things. Um, and I won't, I won't go through the detail necessarily behind this, um, but it's, it's, um, it's aimed at some new phenotype and, and sort of sensor technology that we're evaluating, um, integrating, working out how to integrate a whole range of data using a uh, thing called panomics. There's a, there's a whole range of different omics. Omics are just essentially things that you measure um, and, and they're, they're sort of in a bit of a hierarchy within, within the plant. Um, and so these are sort of molecular sort of characteristics that we're looking at when we look at, when we're talking about panomics. Putting all those things together, together with environmental modelling and feeding that into what we call a genomic prediction or a genomic selection model. And really the whole aim of that is to try and take some of that environmental variability out of it. You've got to put good data into it to start with, but once you get that up and running, the, um, the idea is, is that, um, and I guess this is the ultimate goal down here, is really to get a faster rate of genetic gain for, for dry land systems. It's easier to do this in an irrigated system, as I said, because things are much more controlled. Um, but dry land is quite challenging from that perspective. And so this, this new sort of research area, um, it's not going to, it's not going to um, I guess, bear fruit for a while yet. But certainly over the next three to four years, we'll be generating the data um, that will allow us then to, um, I guess, uh, move forward with it. So there are some new techniques and some different things on the, on the horizon um, that, we're, that we've started. And um, as I said, it's going to be a while yet, but we are, we are putting a lot of investment into this area now. I think I'll leave it there, um, unless anybody's got any specific questions. Can that include root growth? Yeah, so one of the things around this, around this, this stuff here, is, is not to, so, so that's sort of the things that we've done in the past. What we've done is we've said, well, this particular trait, that'll be important. So we'll go and measure that trait. And then we'll look at another individual trait this is a different approach altogether. It's looking at measuring things in the plant that integrate a lot of those other things. And so um, um, there's a whole range of things that we're evaluating. We don't know which ones are going to end up going in the model, but um, uh, some of it's based on multi-spec imaging. Um, so, so looking at a whole range of different wavelengths. And so what essentially we're doing is we're measuring a whole range of things that we can measure at scale. Things like root growth is virtually impossible to measure um, in a, any sort of, it's hard enough doing on one plant, let alone trying to evaluate a hundred different varieties and, and measure their root growth. So what we're looking at, as I said, a lot of these other technologies are around looking for things that are correlated with something. 
And so, so what you're saying is right, root growth will be one of those things, but we're not looking to measure it directly. We're looking to measure other things that, that give an indication, I guess, of, um, of performance. Something that we can measure at scale, at large numbers. That's always a challenge in a breeding program, is, is it's got to be scalable. Um, so, so we're moving away from, at least in this area, we'll still do, we'll, this will be in parallel to the stuff that we're currently doing, this is adding on to it. Um, but it's, it's, it's looking at a whole range of sort of, um, I guess, of what we call novel phenotypes rather than individual traits. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I can talk to you later about it. Warwick, a while ago you were doing heat tolerance and I think some of the stuff was putting leaves in hot bars and all sorts of things like that. Yep. Is that paying any, is that, is that coming Yeah, up? so that's actually feeding into this same, so Warren Connolly, who wasn't able to make it today, He's, he's looking after his project, he was doing that stuff as well. So part of that, it comes back to the same, sort of the same question um, um, that was, uh, that Blatchie was asking, was around, we're moving away from looking at individual traits to, to much higher level sort of stuff. But all of that work that's been done is all, has, is all feeding into this stuff, yep. Yeah.